back in February when I first covered the Red Magic 8 Pro with Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, I never imagined that in this same year would we get a dedicated handheld with one of the most powerful Snapdragon chipsets available today. There was no doubt that I was absolutely ecstatic when the news came out that AYN's sequel to their beloved Odin handheld would be powered by the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 and is now the most powerful Android handheld available on the market with AYN already starting to ship units to their Indiegogo backers as this video rolls. There's so much to cover here and this will no doubt be one of the longest videos on my channel and in many ways rightfully so as the Odin 2 is truly positioned to be the Android handheld to own for a long time to come. So please join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, as we explore everything that the Odin 2 has to offer. It's time for specs so we can get familiar with the Odin 2 before we really dive deep into this one. The Odin 2 is equipped with a 6 inch IPS screen with a 1920 by 1080 resolution and is powered by Qualcomm's incredibly powerful Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which is an 8 core CPU with a Cortex X3 Prime core that has clock speeds up to 3.2 GHz. It has Adreno 740 graphics. The Odin 2 is available in three configurations. The Odin Base with 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage. The Pro with 12GB of RAM and 256GB of storage. And lastly, the Max with 16GB of RAM and 512GB of storage. All three configurations use LP DDR5X RAM and UFS 4.0 internal storage. The unit sent to me for review is the 12GB Pro model. The Odin 2 includes Wi Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.3. There is a USB 3.1 Type-C port for data, charging, and display out, as well as a micro HDMI for video out and 3.5mm headset port. The Odin 2 features a hefty 8000 mAh battery with support for the 65 watt Quick Charge 5.0. It ships with Android 13 out of the box, and it is available directly from AYN's website to purchase with a current estimated ship date of middle of December. Units are shipping out to Indiegogo backers at the time of publishing this video. The Indiegogo campaign has now ended, but AYN is still selling these for the Indiegogo price, starting at $299 US dollars for the base model, $369 US dollars for the pro model, and finally $459 dollars for the max model. The unit here was provided to me by AYN for the purpose of this review, and as I always require, they did not review this video prior to publishing. I have personally backed the Max model in the clear blue colorway. As I mentioned, AYN is now actively shipping units out to those that backed the Odin 2 during their Indiegogo campaign. You can check the AYN website directly for shipping information to get the latest status of the units that have been sent out. If you did back during the Indiegogo campaign, I definitely recommend keeping an eye out on this page to get an idea of when your unit will ship, which is shown based on your contribution ID number from your Indiegogo order history. Okay, so with that out of the way, it's now time to unbox the Odin 2 and check out what comes inside the package. And I have to say right off the bat, this is a beautiful package. It does feel like a premium experience and really invites you to pick it up and see what's inside. The front of the package is just awesome with great details that reflect with the light. Looking around the box, and there are no markings except on the back where we have the model and color options checked off so we know what's inside here. As you can see, I was provided with the Pro model in white. For reference, I chose the clear blue as the unit that I backed during the Indiegogo campaign. Let's set this down for a moment and then make use of the strap on the front and gently pull the tray out. And again, this all just ties in so nicely to give off a great first impression. Okay, time to take this insert off. And here we have that similar reflective detail as seen on the front of the package. However, this insert serves as a dual purpose. And on the back side, we actually have a full readout of the Odin 2's inputs and ports, as well as a listing of the specifications. Below the insert, we have the included screen protector. And I do like the little touch of having the AYN logo on the screen protector. 
Time to get the Odin 2 out of here, but before we check it out, let's put it aside and then get the plastic insert out, which is used to hold the Odin 2 securely in place. Now don't mind me, I'm just impressed that even something as random as the plastic of the insert is higher quality than expected, which has this nice felt texturing on the top. Okay, with the insert out of the way, we do have one lone item remaining, which is the included USB Type-C to Type-C cable. You might have noticed that there is no power adapter in the package itself. However, AYN did include it in the mailing materials, and this is a 100 watt charging block, which is crucial to make use of the 65 watt quick charge capability of the Odin 2. This is a pretty hefty and substantial adapter as expected. It's now finally time to reveal the Odin 2 and release it from its baggy prison. We will go nice and slow, and this white is just absolutely stunning in person. Given the vast color options, it's not one I would have went with initially, but now seeing it in person, I really am just loving it. And the Odin 2 just feels so great in the hands, it's already noticeably different compared to the original Odin Pro and Odin Lite. And so, this is as good of a time as ever to take a tour around the Odin 2 and get close up with all that it has to offer. As always, let's start with the top right corner where we can see that like the original Odin, they are using the stacked shoulder button configuration here. The R1 is pressing down nicely across the entire surface and you can probably hear that it's a fairly subdued clickiness and not overly loud. I'm not noticing any finishing issues here. Below that we have of course the R2 trigger, which is an improvement over the ones featured on the original Odin models. This one really has a nice amount of travel and range. I do like that it is also a wider trigger, so your finger has more surface area to rest on. The movement of the R2 trigger is really nice and smooth. There's no creaking or noise to make note of here. Moving along beside the L1 button, we have the power button, which also acts as a fingerprint sensor for security features. The LED indicator, volume up and down rocker, the exhaust vent for the active cooling, the micro HDMI out, and then the micro SD slot for memory expansion, which is protected by this cover that swivels out. And finally, the left shoulder button and trigger. Very much like the right side, these feel and sound the same with a very subtle clickiness to the L1 button and a nice smooth movement for the L2 trigger. Again, I really do like the size of the shoulder triggers here. Everything is finished well here without any issues. Moving down that left side now, you can see we have the much more pronounced grips compared to the original Odin, which adds a lot of comfort to the Odin 2, as well as the LED strip that runs along the majority of the left side. Now down at the bottom of the unit, we have the 3.5mm headset port, and right beside that, the USB 3.1 Type-C port which is used for data, charging, and display out. Now coming up to the right side, and just like the left, we have the nice pronounced grip as well as that LED strip. So on the back of the Odin 2, the first immediately noticeable element here is the large intake vent made for the active cooling built into the Odin 2. Another not so noticeable and subtle element is the AYN logo right below that vent, adding just a small element of classiness to the overall unit. And then finally, the left and right programmable buttons. Let's now go front side, and at the top left we have what acts as the select button. These have a very subtle clickiness to them. Now right below that is one of my favorite improvements coming from the original Onan, and one that I've been excited about ever since using the Retroid Pocket 2S, which are these much improved Hall Effect analog sticks that mimic a traditional analog stick versus the more common Switch style analog sticks that we have seen on a lot of these handhelds, including the original Odin. As you can see, these give us much better range and motion compared to the Switch style ones and really are such a massive improvement over what came before with the original Odin. Here's a look from the side so we can see how these sit above the face of the device. Below that is something that is returning from the original Odin, which is this Vita inspired D-pad, and I absolutely love this D-pad. The movement here feels so satisfying as well as that subtle clickiness that seems to be very much a theme across much of the Odin too. The D-pad has some really good pivoting from the top to bottom and left to right, and I'm excited to try this out in a little bit. And then below the D-pad we have the home button and finally the left side stereo speaker. There are no markings on the bezel of the display. On the right side we have the equivalent of the start button at the top, and below that the face buttons which are set up in the Nintendo style BAYX configuration. Now these are interesting since they do feel a little bit different compared to the original Odin. 
I do like the way that these press down, I think they have just the right amount of trap. However, I will say that these are a little bit noisier than the original Odin Pro's face buttons. Next, we have the right analog stick, the back button, and the right side stereo speaker. And really, everything overall just feels super comfortable to hold. And so with that, it's time to boot this up for the first time. You will probably notice that the boot logo is using the older one since I did receive this unit prior to the firmware update with the boot logo change. However, the process here is mostly the same. Much like other Odin products, we have a guided setup process which makes this feel less like an Android phone experience. So navigation here is mostly handled by using the built-in controller or touch screen. Here is where you will set up your Wi-Fi connection for the first time, set the time, and then select the default launcher to use which is either the standard Android one or the Odin launcher. We will briefly go over the Odin launcher in just a moment. Welcome to the main screen of the Odin 2. And one of the first things I always pay attention to is how vanilla the Android build is here. And you, as you can probably see on screen, there's very little installed and definitely something I appreciate. Let's now switch into direct capture and I can show you around a bit more. This portion was recorded with the latest firmware of the Odin 2, and so you will notice that it now has the newer background image and any changes that were made at the time of publishing this video. So let's go through a few key features built into Android. Let's first start with the quick access menu, which you can get to by swiping down from the top of the screen. Here is where you'll be able to make quick on the fly adjustments. Some of the key adjustments, of course, are things like brightness, but here is where you'll also be able to change the performance mode settings. There is a choice between standard, performance, and high performance. You will notice that toggling certain performance mode options will also set the fan to a default setting related to the performance mode option. Beside the performance mode setting, we have the ability to quickly adjust the ambient LEDs. You can either turn on or off both the joystick and side LEDs as well as adjust the brightness of the LED lights from here. Finally, there are a few color options to quickly select on the fly. You will see in just a bit that we do have the ability to adjust these for a full range of colors. Continuing on, we can set the fan between three different options which are quiet, smart, and sport. Another great feature of the Odin 2 is the charging separation which will stop providing power to the battery after it has been charged to 100%. Instead, the handheld will pull power directly from the power supply. This feature actually helps preserve the battery. And now we do have the other usual options here like Bluetooth and airplane mode. On the next screen, we have a few more standard features seen in a lot of Android devices. However, one of the unique ones to the Odin 2 is the ability to turn on the floating icon which is seen on the right hand of the screen and allows you to bring up the Odin 2 overlay. Now on this last page, I have added two of my own quick access icons for screen recording and the extra dim option, which is now an included feature of Android. Much like other Android devices, you can organize, remove, and add tiles that you want based on your need. Okay, so let's continue on with our interface tour and check out the settings in Android. But in particular, let's head into the Odin 2 settings. As I mentioned earlier, we have the ability to adjust things further in this section. The first thing you will notice is the ambient LED options. Similar to the quick access, we can turn the LEDs on or off. However, below that we have the option to adjust the LED colors with a much wider range of options. Now moving along, we have some adjustments that we can make for the video out functionality. I very much appreciate that AYN thought about its use case as a docked handheld much like a Nintendo Switch. Therefore, you will see that AYN has already set this up to turn the Odin 2's screen off as well as disable the auto sleep function of Android. You can change these settings here as needed. Scrolling down a bit more, and here is where we have a bunch of options related to the built-in controller of the Odin 2. For example, you can set the Odin 2 to use the Xbox or Nintendo input. You can program the M1 and M2 keys and even go ahead and do a joystick calibration, which is definitely something I recommend doing when you first receive your unit. Another great feature built into the Odin 2 is the overlay that you can access when in game. You can reach this by swiping in from the right side of the screen which will bring up the overlay. Here we have quick access to things like brightness controls, the frame rate counter which can also be enabled as a floating icon on screen, the temperature of the device, and readouts of the CPU and memory. In addition, you can access the built-in gamepad mapping feature for games that do not have controller support. I will be demonstrating this a bit more in just a little bit. Finally, there are icons to reach useful things like screen capture, recording, and a neat speed up feature which clears running processes so that all of the RAM is available to the current process. So now I think it's a good time to check out the Odin launcher. 
This is a fairly simple front end which you can launch your apps from. It's meant to give the Odin 2 a more console-like experience, but in reality, given that we are on Android, we have tons of great options available for front ends. And so if you are someone that likes having things organized this way or having a setup that resembles a console, something like Daijisho will be the way to go. Okay, so in the bottom right, we have a few basic options, including the Odin settings, which just takes you into the Odin settings in Android that we just checked out earlier. Let's go ahead and add a few apps here so we can populate this screen. So I'll just quickly add a few of these to the launcher screen. Back to the bottom right, we have the ability to change the layout. All this does is change the size of the icons. And beside that, we have the option to change the wallpaper for the launcher screen. Now we do have the option to swipe in from the left side of the screen where we have a few more options. From here, we can adjust the performance mode, toggle the LEDs to on or off, and then sort the apps by categories. You can also change between a dark and light theme. Beyond that, there's not much else to cover here, and as I mentioned, it is a very simple launcher. So, with the software tour out of the way, let's now get a bit more close up with the hardware and talk about the actual build quality. When I first held the Odin 2, I immediately noticed how great it felt in the hands. It's definitely comfortable, but most importantly, the materials and finishing here are really great. During my bend test, the device showed no signs of flexing or creaking. The plastic here feels great, and again, the finishing overall is just top notch. Everything is pressing down properly and doesn't get stuck or feels rough in movement. Doing a rattle test and you can hear that there is minimal rattling on the unit coming from the left side. Now let's talk about the display, and much like the original Odin, we have a 6 inch panel on display here running at a 1920 by 1080 resolution. The image is quite good, and while not the brightest display I have seen, it is more than enough for indoor situations. I do like the brightness scaling here, and as such it can accommodate a wide variety of scenarios. Not only that, but with that extra dim option, the screen can get really dim for those that game at night in bed or are trying not to disturb someone beside them. Not only that, but this is a better panel compared to my Odin Pro. Now I will try my best to capture the differences between the two here on camera, but just in person looking at the images, the Odin 2 is the superior device when it comes to brightness and picture quality. The image on the Odin 2 does not distort when viewed at different angles from the top to bottom or side to side. This is definitely more of an issue present for me on my original Odin Pro. Another welcome change here is the front firing stereo speakers, compared to both the Odin Pro and Odin Lite, which have them set up as down firing. These speakers definitely get quite loud on the highest setting. I did notice that the volume scaling is a bit weird, and at least to me, it feels like we go from a very high volume down to a very quiet one only about midway through. The good thing is that this is something that can be corrected in the future with an update. Finally, I did notice that my right hand obstructed the speaker at times and caused the sound to get muffled a bit when in-game, especially reaching in for the Y button, but this is a minor complaint. So let's hop into some Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and I've got the PlayStation 2 version running here, and I think it's a good opportunity to try this D-pad out, and things have gone very well for me despite my lack of skills in fighting games. I'm able to move around without much issue, and nailing combos in succession is proving to be not so difficult, as well as consistent for someone as skilled as myself. The D-pad is responding quite well to my movements, especially when hitting the corners. And it's now that time when we're joined by some friends and size up the Odin 2 on its own and against some other popular choices in the handheld space. Up first, of course, is the Odin 2, and this beauty comes in at 419 grams or just shy of 15 ounces. Next up is the predecessor to the Odin 2. Here we have the Odin Pro, and naturally a very good device to compare against. The Odin Pro comes in at a little under 13 ounces or 361 grams, making the Odin Pro lighter than the Odin 2 by about 60 grams or 2 ounces, which is not as drastic of a weight difference. Here is another AYN device, the Loki Mini Pro, a Windows-based handheld with the AMD Mendocino. This one is a bit heavier and bulkier at 572 grams or about 1 pound 4 ounces. For fun, here is the Logitech G Cloud, which is priced identical to the base model Odin 2 and is equipped with a larger 7 inch screen and great ergonomics, but nowhere near as powerful. This one comes in at 1 pound or 463 grams. 
As always, we can't talk handhelds without comparing to the original Nintendo Switch, which comes in at 398 grams or 14 ounces. Finally, for one last comparison, here is the big boy, the Steam Deck coming in at almost 1 pound 8 ounces or 677 grams. And while I have the Steam Deck out, let's do a direct size comparison of the two devices. Of course, to no one's surprise, the Steam Deck is substantially bigger than the Odin 2. And here is the AYN family of devices with the Odin Pro at the left, the Odin 2 in the middle, and the Loki Mini Pro at the right. Next up is the Logitech G Cloud, which is a larger device as well compared to the Odin 2. Here is the original Nintendo Switch with the Joy-Cons attached, and this is also a larger device in width compared to the Odin 2. The Switch does have a slightly larger display at 6.2 inches. Let's now measure the face buttons and analog stick cap of the Odin 2 as well as some other devices to get a good sense overall. The Odin 2 face buttons measure in at about 7.2mm and the analog stick cap is about 13.5mm in diameter. Now sizing this up to the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con face buttons which are definitely smaller at around 6.7mm. And the Odin Pro which are nearly identical in size to the Odin 2's face buttons. Here is the G Cloud face buttons which are larger at around 7.8mm. And finally the Steam Deck which have the largest face buttons and not surprising given the size of the device at 8.5mm. And when it comes to thickness, the Odin 2 measures in at just shy of 18mm. The Odin Pro which is about 15mm in thickness and so the Odin 2 did gain a little bit in thickness coming from the Pro. The Nintendo Switch comes in at about 14.5mm. The Logitech G Cloud, which is similar in thickness at its thinnest point at around 14.5mm, and then the Steam Deck, which is just shy of 19mm at its thinnest point. Let's now size up the Odin family of devices, and here we have the Odin Pro, Odin 2, and Odin Lite all making an appearance together. The Odin 2 definitely tries to remain similar in size to the Odin Pro and Lite. From the overhead perspective, the Odin 2 is just a little bit thicker than the Odin Pro at its center point. At the grips though, the Odin 2 is definitely thicker, but that's mostly thanks to the pronounced grips that are now on the Odin 2, which makes this a much more comfortable device to hold. Personally, I take that trade off as it really does improve the ergonomics of the Odin 2. One of the biggest improvements with the Odin 2 comes with its analog stick, which finally ditches the Switch style sticks in favor of one that has much better range and movement. These are the same sticks that were introduced on the Retroid Pocket 2S. I also like that the Odin 2 now has front firing speakers, which the Odin Pro and Lite did not have. They were down firing on both of those models and as a result, the device does sound much better. Again, ergonomics are also much better here with the Odin 2. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, this screen is an improvement coming from the Odin Pro and I think many will appreciate that this is a better display overall. Okay, so we've definitely gotten quite familiar with the Odin 2 in many ways, but now it's time to delve deeper and head into one of my favorite parts, which is the teardown portion. So taking a look at the back here, and we do have four screws that need to be removed before we can pop this back cover off. As always, I'll grab my trusty iFixit kit and size up the appropriate bit to use here. Looking at these screws a bit closer, and it does appear to be using a Torx screw. Now initially I went with the T4 bit, but I do recommend using the T5 instead as it's a more secure fit. So let's quickly get these four screws off and then figure out our point of entry. So looking around the Odin 2, I did notice that I can get a bit of leeway in the shell by gently pulling back in the trigger area, causing some separation which will allow us to get some kind of wedge tool in there to begin the separation process. Make sure to use a tool that does not go too far into the shell as you don't want to potentially damage any internal components. The tabs here are very strong and will require a bit of force to separate. I just went one by one across the top of the unit until the entirety of the top was separated, allowing me to then just pry the back cover off by hand. The good thing here is that nothing is attached to that back cover and so when you do finally separate it, you do not need to worry about any cables or connections. With the back cover off, let's check out what we have here, and as you can see, the back cover is a fairly flexible plastic which isn't too much of an issue as this will help keep the weight of the handheld down. The programmable back buttons did fall out when I removed the back cover, which again is not an issue and it easily goes back into place during the reassembly process. I did want to point out that AYN even went as far as putting pads on the contact point for these back buttons to help dampen and soften the presses. I do appreciate the small attention to details like this. 
Let's pick up the Odin 2 and get ourselves a nice centered shot of the unit without the back cover on. We can see lots of different and important things going on here just from this visual and we can also take the time to appreciate the engineering that went into making this as compact as possible. Here we can take a closer look at the Hall Effect triggers and see this smooth action in motion. At the bottom of the unit we can see the large stereo speakers packed into the Odin 2. It does look like the right analog stick is easily accessible and replaceable. However, the left analog stick is not as easily accessible and will require removal of at least the trigger, but we will dive in further to verify that. Let's take a closer look at this battery, which is an 8000 mAh or 30.8 Watt hour battery. Its impressive AYN was able to pack a sizable battery into this small of a handheld. In the middle, we get a nice look at the fan, which provides the active cooling. It's definitely much larger than what I experienced with the Red Magic 8 Pro, and that's understandable given the size we are working with here. One last thing I wanted to do before we continue on is actually turn the unit back on so we can see that fan spinning and take a look at the LEDs without the cover on. I thought this would be something fun to look at. And so with the power on, we can see how the LEDs look here. Okay, so to continue with our teardown, we will need to change out our bit and go with a standard Phillips head bit. For this, I decided to go with a Phillips head double zero sized bit, which should accommodate our needs throughout the teardown. So to start, I'm going to get the screws off the LED strip on the left side. The vibration motor is attached to this and all connected on the same ribbon cable. There are three screws holding the LED strip in place. With the screws removed, gently remove the cable so that we can free this from the board. And here's a closer look at the LED and vibration motor. Now we will go ahead and remove the three screws that are holding in place the trigger on the left side. Once those three screws have been removed, the trigger comes off nice and easy. And we might as well go ahead and remove the analog stick from here since it's actually easily removable and not covered by anything else. This would be the right analog stick and it is held into place with two screws. Before removing the analog stick, make sure to disconnect the cable by gently lifting the tab on the daughter board. The analog stick cap actually pops off and then we can remove the assembly and now we can take a closer look at this. This is really nice and compact, but again very different than the usual switch style sticks and this here gives a nice range of motion. Okay, back to the daughter board now and at the top we have another cable to disconnect that is held in with a tab that needs to gently be lifted up so it can be disconnected. There is another cable to disconnect at the right as well and it is also held in place with a tab that needs to be gently lifted. You might have noticed that I have the speaker disconnected already, and for a full removal of the daughter board you will need to unscrew the speaker which will give us full access. The speaker is held into place with two screws. You will not be able to disconnect the ribbon cable, and so just carefully leave it off to the side out of the way. So there are now three screws to remove on this daughter board so that we can free the daughter board from the shell. With the screws removed we can now take a closer look at the right daughter board which holds the right analog stick and face buttons. You can hear, or maybe not hear, the dome switches which are definitely very quiet. Let's pull off the rubber membrane from the face buttons and check these out close up. Finally, one last thing to examine here which is how the face buttons are keyed and as you can probably see, these are uniquely keyed and therefore cannot be swapped if you wanted a different layout. I wanted to show the inside of these buttons close up since these are really nicely made and much higher quality than your usual face buttons. Again, I'm just really appreciating a lot of the smaller details here with the Odin 2. So now that we've disassembled the right daughter board, it's time to move to the next thing here which is the battery. One of the most important aspects for these teardowns is to really examine the feasibility and ease of access for battery replacement. Unfortunately, the Odin 2 battery isn't a simple pop the back cover off and take the battery out process. The battery is connected to the mainboard of the Odin 2, which happens to be covered by a few items that we will now be taking a look at. The first thing we will be doing is removing this plastic shield that is in place over the heatsink and mainboard. The plastic shield is held down with two screws, so we will go ahead and remove those right now. With the screws removed, this comes out very easily. This plastic piece is mostly window dressing, but again, these details are appreciated. It serves as something that adds beauty to the interior of the Odin 2, but also adds rigidity to the frame. 
With that plastic piece off, we still don't quite have access to the battery connector and so we will continue on with our teardown. Another thing I've noticed here is that the speaker cable is connected right here but is ran across under the battery and so this speaker can't really be removed without fully removing the battery. You can also see that part of the antenna is soldered here. Okay, well it's time to remove the warranty sticker and get access to some more screws here. The fan itself is held into place with two screws. The one screw that is under the warranty sticker marked with an A and then there's another screw on the opposite corner underneath the foam sticker that will need to be peeled back just a little bit to get access to it. With both screws out, the fan will come out pretty easily. We still need to continue on to get access to that battery connector as it is covered by the heatsink in place here. The heatsink is held into place by two additional screws and so we will go ahead and remove that so we can finally gain access to the battery connector and take a peek at the bare mainboard of the Odin 2. With those two screws out of the way, the heatsink comes off very easily and reveals the very solid cooling solution here for that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Here is a close up of the Odin 2 mainboard with that thermal pad over the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. And finally we have access to the battery connector. So let's pop it off and this is what would be required if you wanted to swap the battery out in case of repair or replacement. There is an adhesive that holds the battery in place, but there is a tab that allows you to pull out the battery, but for now, I will be leaving this alone. I'm going to go ahead and screw the speaker back into place so it's not just dangling around while we move on over to the right side and take a closer look at that left analog stick and what will be required to get access to it. So we're going to start by removing the three screws that are holding the left trigger into place. Once those have been removed, the trigger should easily come off just like it did for the right trigger. Nice and easy, and now we have access to that left analog stick. There's a metal block over the stick assembly which is very interesting and really just further demonstrates the solid build here with the Odin 2. This metal piece just pops right off and is not held into place with any screws. So now just like the right analog stick, this left analog stick is held into place with two screws. With the two screws removed, you will want to disconnect the cable. However, you actually need to remove the LED strip that is in place here in order to gain access to the retention tab so that you can safely take out the analog stick. Okay, so let's quickly get these three screws out of here and then the LED strip will lift up nice and easy and with that out of the way, we can finally now lift the tab and pull out the analog stick safely. And so with that, we now have an idea of the replacement process for that left analog stick. And at this point, I think we've covered quite a bit with this teardown. And so it's now time to talk numbers with benchmarks on the Odin 2. We're going to do a few different things here in this section. First up, we will compare the numbers between the different performance mode options in a range of benchmarking suites. Here we have Geekbench 6, and for this I've included all three performance mode options. As you can see, and probably as expected, the high performance mode gives us the best that the Odin 2 can provide to us, and then scales down from there. It's not quite as drastic of a difference between these numbers, which is definitely interesting to make note of. Much of the same is seen here with the 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme Test, which focuses on GPU performance. In fact, I got identical scores under the high performance and performance modes. And finally, we are seeing the same pattern here with the Antutu Benchmark Suite, which is a good overall test of the CPU and GPU performance. Next, we will compare the Odin 2 against a phone I have covered many times on the channel, the Red Magic 8 Pro with the same Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. For those unfamiliar, the Red Magic 8 Pro is actively cooled, and if you are curious about it, definitely check out my video from the beginning of the year on this device. I've got the Red Magic 8 Pro set to Diablo mode, which is the best performance we can get out of the phone. I thought that this would be an interesting comparison just to see how well the Odin 2 is performing with that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. In Geekbench 6, the Odin 2 scored higher than the Red Magic 8 Pro. And you might notice another set of numbers here, which really demonstrates the massive increase in performance coming from the Odin Pro with the Snapdragon 845 and going to the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 in the Odin 2. On the multi-core score, the Odin 2 saw nearly a 170% increase in performance over the Odin Pro and almost a 260% increase in the single core score, which are absolutely incredible gains here. For the Wildlife Extreme Test, the Odin 2 yet again just narrowly shows better numbers over the Red Magic 8 Pro, and again the Odin 2 absolutely blows away the Odin Pro with almost 6 times the score of the Odin Pro. 
And finally, for the Antutu benchmark, the Odin 2 and Red Magic 8 Pro are showing very similar results, which is excellent for the Odin 2 as it's really utilizing the full potential of that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Finally, and not much of a surprise here, but the Odin 2 is just demolishing the Odin Pro with more than four times the overall score of the Odin Pro. The Odin 2 is not just a generational leap over the Odin Pro, but a multi-generational leap in terms of what we are getting here in performance. One last thing I wanted to show here before we finally dive into some gaming is the excellent thermal stability on hand here with the Odin 2 and that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Using the Wildlife Extreme Stress Test, we can see that the Odin 2, in high performance mode with the fans set to sport mode, maintain a 97.9% .9 stability percentage. In the performance mode setting with the fans set to quiet, the Odin 2 had a stability percentage of 92.9%, and finally, in standard performance with no fan turned on, the Odin 2 had a stability percentage of 87.3%. We are seeing that the active cooling is doing a very nice job maintaining performance. It's now finally time to talk emulation on the Odin 2, and we're going to do things a bit differently here in this section since we're just going to start right off the bat with the most demanding platform available to run on Android, which is Nintendo Switch emulation using the Yuzu emulator. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I've covered Switch emulation quite extensively with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, and really it has been one of the things I've been looking forward to most with the arrival of the Odin 2. It is definitely worth reiterating that while Switch performance is incredibly impressive with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, the Yuzu emulator is still very much a work in progress and in active development. Therefore, things will continue to improve as the emulator matures. I've witnessed this progress myself and have even documented it on the channel. For those unaware, we only received Yuzu for Android earlier this year, and its progress has been nothing short of amazing. In fact, running newer games like Super Mario Wonder and Sonic Superstars has proven to be a better experience than I could have ever hoped for. But one of the best things about the Switch library is the vast amount of games available to us, and in particular low-key indie games like Tunic here really run well and expand the amount of games that are available to us to play on Android and on a device with some serious power under the hood like the Odin 2. Mario Kart 8 is a perfect example of a game that I've tracked over the past few months and have witnessed it go from running half speed to now nearly being a locked 60 frames per second experience on the Odin 2. This is really a treat to see. And it's almost impossible to not showcase some Breath of the Wild. And again, it's a game that keeps getting more stable with better frame rate as time goes on with Yuzu for Android. I'm just beyond excited to see where we end up next year with Switch emulation as Yuzu progresses, but also when we have the successor to Skyline, the emulator known as Straddle make an appearance. The developers have been showing off their progress and that is one that is shaping up to be another great option. Finally, I did want to mention that while the games I demonstrated here were all running with Yuzu for Android, it's still worth checking out Skyline, and in particular, the last build which was version 69, as some games still run great in that emulator that might not run properly over in Yuzu. I did cover both Yuzu and Skyline with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, and I definitely recommend checking out those videos to get an idea of the kind of games playable with those emulators, and also to see some of that progress I was talking about. Now with all of this talk about the Switch, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the earlier generations from Nintendo, namely the GameCube and Wii. For both of these platforms, we are able to use the mainline Dolphin build straight from the Play Store for the majority of games, and we are now at a point that the only thing holding back emulation is the emulator itself. However, the results here with GameCube and Wii are nothing short of amazing. On the Wii side, games like Super Mario Galaxy will have no issues running up to five times the native resolution, and even lighter games will be able to max out Dolphin's resolution scaling of up to six times the native resolution. It's really something special to witness in person just how great a game like Mario Galaxy 2 looks on the Odin 2. And of course, on the GameCube side, even a heavy hitter like F-Zero GX is running at the max resolution scaling of six times the native. And again, the results are impressive with the Odin 2 barely breaking a sweat here using the standard performance mode of the Odin 2.
finally, one last Nintendo platform I wanted to showcase here is the 3DS using Citra Canary. And again, it's another one that we can max out going with four times the native resolution using the OpenGL backend. Super Mario 3D Land is looking absolutely beautiful on this display. So let's switch over to Sony, and first we will talk about one that I don't think many will be surprised by as PlayStation Portable emulation with PPSSPP is very mature and runs on tons of devices. However, here on the Odin 2, we are now essentially able to max out going as high as 10 times the native resolution of PSP, and for a good portion of the library, performance will be excellent which is just incredible to see. I think this is the first time on the channel that I've demonstrated Ridge Racer running at 10 times the native resolution. And again, the Odin 2 is doing this without breaking much of a sweat, using just the standard performance mode. I have PPSSPP set to use the Vulcan backend. But even a heavier hitter like God of War Ghost of Sparta is having no issues running at 10 times with standard performance maintaining a locked 60 frames per second. Finally, let's talk about another console that I think many will be excited to emulate with the Odin 2, as we have now entered the point of almost no tinkering required to just load up and play PlayStation 2 games here with Nether SX2. Not only that, but we can easily crank up that resolution scaling, and for a lot of the PlayStation 2 library, we will be able to go as much as 3 or 4 times the native resolution of the PlayStation 2. This is another platform that will be just an absolute joy to play here on the Odin 2, and once again, we are only limited by the actual emulator and not by the available power of the handheld. The Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 is an absolute monster. So with emulation, as we've witnessed here, we essentially are at the point that the emulator itself is holding us back, and not the hardware as nearly every platform on the Odin 2 will be capable of maxing out the performance available to us with the specific emulator. Now something I'm very passionate about is native Android gaming, and there are actually lots of great games that are available for Android. I've covered some great choices on the channel, and do look forward to making a return to this topic in the future. With the Odin 2, we are pretty much able to play everything that is available to us without any issues, and high-end ports like Alien Isolation will be able to max out without issue, really allowing us to flex the muscle of that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. I also wanted to highlight a little bit of the Principles tech demo since this is a fun way to show off some of the power that we have here with the Odin 2, and I've used the same demo back on the Red Magic 8 Pro when demoing that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. Principles is running here with all settings turned up, and for the Odin 2, it's got no issues handling it. Finally, let's showcase some Genshin Impact, and also take a moment to briefly show off the built-in gamepad mapping with the Odin 2. Unfortunately, Genshin Impact on Android does not have native controller support, however, it's not much of an issue thanks to the gamepad mapper. The easiest way to access this is to swipe in from the right, and then hit the key adapter which will bring up the gamepad mapping menu. From here we have the ability to map the buttons and the left and right analog sticks. So let's add the left analog stick on screen and position it to match up with the existing touch-based analog stick in Genshin. You do have a bunch of options to adjust here when you click on the left analog stick. However, for the sake of this video, we will simply leave it on virtual joystick mode and then continue on. So let's now add the right analog stick, and like the left one, we can click on the analog stick and set some options up here as well. 
Genshin uses the right analog stick for adjusting the camera, and so for this game, I like to use the adjust view mode and then adjust sensitivity from there. Okay, now let's quickly add some buttons on screen and map them to some of these actions. Again, this is as simple as dragging the button icon from the menu up top and then positioning them to where you want to place it. Once you have placed the buttons down, you can then tap on each one of them to map it to a physical button. So let me just quickly throw some of these down so I can demonstrate how well everything works here. Now ignore the swipes that you see on screen as this is because of the screen recording that I have set up. You will not see these screen swipes when playing. Finally, you might notice that the button icons stay on screen. However, that is also easily correctable by simply going back into the key adapter and then selecting the gear icon from the menu and adjusting the transparency of the icons. So with all that gaming, it's time to talk about battery life and thermals. For this, I went ahead and conducted numerous tests to really get a feel for how that 8000 mAh battery performs here, and so I've tested a few different scenarios. Let's start out with the worst battery life, which was with Switch emulation using the Yuzu emulator. I had the Odin 2 set to 50% brightness and 50% volume. However, for this, I am using the high performance mode with the fan set to sport as well as leaving the Wi-Fi on and the LEDs on set to the highest brightness. This is basically going to represent one of the worst case scenarios with that battery, and for this, Breath of the Wild managed just under 3 hours of battery life. But things continue to get better from here on out. Moving on to PlayStation 2 emulation with Nether SX2, and as usual, it's time to make Kratos dive endlessly, and so with my usual God of War 2 battery test, which we have running here at 3 times native resolution. The Odin 2 is set to 50% brightness and volume using standard performance, no fan, no LEDs, and the battery saver and airplay modes turned on, and we did reach 4 hours of battery life. Bumping the resolution up is definitely more demanding since using the same testing scenario, but this time around I have God of War 2 set to just native resolution, and now we managed 7 hours of battery life. This is still really great performance either way. Finally, for my light test, as usual, here is Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo using SNES 9X, and at 50% brightness and volume, no fan, no LEDs, with airplane and battery saver mode on, using the standard performance mode setting of the Odin 2 with that fan set to off, and we hit over 17 hours of on-screen time with Yoshi's Island. And really, this is up there with some of the best performance you will see from a handheld device. Finally, with all that gaming, it's time to check the surface temperature of the Odin 2. For this, I am set to high performance mode with the fan set to sport, and I really just wanted to demonstrate here how well the fan moves heat off the device, as I did not record any surface temperature above about 44 degrees Celsius, which was only at one spot on the display itself. As expected, when we move away from the area where the CPU is and away from the display, we start to see the temperature drop by several degrees, and on the back, temperatures were even cooler, and most importantly where the Odin 2 is held, the temperatures were staying nice and low. One last great and important feature is the ability to easily dock or plug in your Odin 2 to a monitor or television. Let's grab my trusty USB Type-C cable and plug this into my portable monitor to demonstrate just how easy it is to play on a larger display. And just like that, I've now got F-Zero GX playing on a larger display. Given how good emulation performance is here, we can really make use of the upscaling capabilities of the Odin 2 and enjoy for example some GameCube at 4K resolution with no issues. The display turns off as expected when in the stock mode and the system does not go into auto sleep. Both of these can be adjusted in the Odin 2 settings as I've demonstrated earlier. One thing I did notice is that there is no option to have the LEDs turn off automatically when in this mode, and so you will need to turn off the LEDs if you do not want them on. I hope AYN can add this as an option, and I will be reaching out to them to suggest this as an addition. So, I think we have finally reached the end of this massive video covering the Odin 2. I don't think there's any doubt that this device is well deserving of all the hype surrounding it. Even after spending nearly 3 weeks with it, I still can't believe that I have in my hands a handheld device powered by the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. But not only that, AYN seemingly has improved in nearly every way possible over the incredibly popular Odin Pro. At the time of publishing this video, units are going out at a consistent pace to Indiegogo backers, and I can't wait to receive the clear blue Max model that I backed. AYN not only has hit their targets, but they have managed to beat their estimates, which really, at the end of the day, was probably the biggest concern for many. 
When it comes to the Odin 2 as a device, this will probably be the high-end Android device to own for many for a long time to come. And really, the next step beyond what the world of Android offers is to move into the x86 space with the likes of the Steam Deck, Asus ROG Ally, and Lenovo Legion Go. But with x86 comes its own unique challenges, but it does open access to the PC library as well as additional emulation platforms like Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Wii U, and more. At the end of the day, we are truly spoiled by choice. And when it comes to Android, especially at the high end, the Onden 2 is a fine choice that I think many will enjoy for a long time to come. And with that, expect to see a lot more Odin 2 content in the future as this device is a very important one to me and one that I will be continuing to cover. Until then, as always, I am the Retro Tech Dad and thank you so much for watching.